to uh, introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion. Uh, these are folks who have benefited from uh, some research leave time and oh, and, and, uh, and some money currently. Uh, from, <laughs> and, and which is, I guess, at the root of social transformation. Um, social Transformation Research Collaborative. Um, what we're going to do is they're going to talk about their projects. Uh, and then we'll open up the conversation and questions. Uh, I'll introduce each panelist uh, just before they're about to speak. Okay? Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so, our first panelist is Susana S. Martinez. Uh, Susana is an associate professor in the Department of Modern Languages, where she teaches Spanish as well as Latin American and Latinx literature. She is also the director of the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Program uh, Studies at, uh, sorry, Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies Program at DePaul. She studied at the University of California, Los Angeles, and Yale University. Her research focuses on the representation of violence and migration in Central American and Mexican literature, and she volunteers with local organizations supporting migrants and families in asylum proceedings. Please welcome Dr. Mike Thank you. Um, I want to begin uh, first by expressing my deepest gratitude to everyone involved in the STRC. The fellowship gave me much needed time and space to think about my project, to write, and to get valuable feedback. So thank you. Um, my project focuses on the representation of the migrant journey in young adult literature. I situate my literary analysis within a critical historical and political context, starting with U.S. intervention in Central America that led to the civil wars of the 1980s and 1990s, particularly Guatemala's 36-year armed struggle that left 200,000 men and included genocide against the Maya. I situate the dangers that migrants experience when crossing Mexico within the context of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, enacted in 1994, the same year that the U.S. Border Patrol implemented the Prevention Through Deterrence Policy that cruelly funded, that cruelly funneled migrants through the desert. Instead of deterring desperate people, the strategy has led to thousands of deaths from dehydration and hypothermia in the Sonoran Desert. Often promoted as capitalism without borders, I examine how neoliberalism's politics of disposability displaces racialized youth, making them more vulnerable to deadly violence on the migrant trail, and then criminalizes them for fleeing for their lives. I devote a chapter to YA novels that feature Mexican narco violence during the so called War on Drugs, including narratives by Mexican and Mexican American authors that explore femicide in Ciudad Juarez, a border city that has become infamous for gender violence. The last two chapters take up the themes of undocumented youth living in the shadows in the US as they go to school, form friendships, and fall in love for the first time, while they or their mixed status families face dehumanizing detention, family separation, and deportation. I'd like to acknowledge that this chronological and geographical layout for the book project really started to take shape in my heart when I began volunteering with local organizations supporting young migrants in detention centers, and when I accompanied a Guatemalan family that fled violence. I joined volunteers from Wellington Avenue Church in Lakeview uh, that sponsored the Guatemalan family. Uh, they found them pro bono attorneys and jobs, 
and we accompanied them through the asylum process. I also served as a court watch volunteer with an interfaith group and witnessed many people request voluntary departure, uh, which is sometimes referred to as uh, self migration or auto, I mean, auto, um, sorry, yeah, self deportation. Um, and they, they requested this because it was so emotionally exhausting and costly to be separated from their loved ones. As volunteers, we were always reminded to stay in the present moment because conversations about the past could re-traumatize people. The resilience of the children and youth in detention always made an impact on me as I wondered um, how closely the YA novels I was reading and writing about mirrored their experiences of fleeing home and crossing Mexico to be safety in the US. I wondered what would happen to them once they were released uh, to reunite with their sponsors. What would their first year of school feel like? Uh, who, who would be their first crush? How would they remember everything that they had just endured at such a tender age? The fact that young, migrant, young migrants experience so-called illegality uh, and undocumentedness these are concepts created to exclude and exploit. Um, this is what I feel uh, connects my project to our politically toxic era of book challenges and bad books, including in white supremacy and racism. The American Library Association reported that book challenges nearly doubled in 2022 from the previous year. Of the reported challenges, 58% targeted books and materials in school libraries, classroom libraries, or school curricula. 41% of book challenges targeted materials in public libraries. So it's no coincidence that young adult titles led the category <coughs> of books banned at 56%, as opposed to 24% for adult books. 15% middle grade, 4% picture book, 1% chapter book. I believe why titles are under fire due to their ability to offer critical perspectives to a population that is simultaneously exploring their own sense of identity and questioning the world around them. They are well aware that conservative policymakers predominantly attack books by authors of color and the LGBTQ plus community, also historically underrepresented in the publishing industry. So I see my work as an intervention in this toxicity and hope that it will be a supportive resource, resource for teachers, librarians, and immigrant justice activists who are facing the brunt of these attacks. With the multiplicity of wars growing all over the world, migration continues to deeply affect youth with no hope in sight for comprehensive immigration reform in the US. Central America and Mexico continue to experience violence and authoritarian limitations to democracy, along with corruption due to state ties to narco trafficking and a neoliberal lack of investment in social welfare. They're opting instead uh, for increased militarization and repression, as we are here. Right? Uh, but I can't help feeling hopeful about recent elections in Guatemala and the ongoing nonviolent indigenous led national strike to protect democracy and fight corruption. Bernardo Arevalo, the president elect, is the son of Guatemala's first democratically elected president who supported labor rights and social welfare spending. His successor was overthrown in 1954 by a CIA-backed military coup. But today, youth are taken to the streets and social media to denounce corrupt politicians and business elites uh, that are seeking to nullify the election. As a former diplomat and peacemaker, it remains to be seen if Arevalo will be allowed to take office in January, 
um, but people are feeling very hopeful, and uh, it's it's amazing to see how empowered, especially youth, are modeling uh, not violence and art space social protests, and all of this on social media like unfolding before the our eyes. So Ethan and I on um, developments in Central America, Mexico, and the rest of the world have kind of helped me um, situate U.S. politics in, in perspective when white supremacy displays this like constantly zero tolerance behavior towards racialized others, and the book ends just start to feel paralyzed. Um, but for youth coming of age in the U.S., particularly youth of color and undocumented Latinx, it's so impactful to see their experiences reflected in the pages of a book. It's so powerful. So why novels uh, can serve as validating mirrors that help, uh, help them make meaning of their histories and identities. Uh, for educators and more privileged youth, there are windows and sliding glass doors that provide insight and encourage empathy, as education scholar Rudine Ruth, Sims Bishop stated back in 1990. So I hope that more Latinx YA authors will gain entry into the white dominant publishing industry. Uh, their work has so much authenticity and nuance to the portrayal of immigrants and to the root causes of migration. And I hope that uh, this project will serve as a counter story to lift up the agency and activism of Central American, Mexican, and Latinx youth that boldly denounces borders and repression, including dehumanizing detention and deportation policies. Thank you so much. Our next uh, speaker is Chair Nona Nusisa Jr. Uh, Dr. Nusisa is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies here at Paul. He has authored uh, book chapters and articles about Black abolitionism uh, during the American Revolution, about the origins of African American Freemasonry, and about the emergence of African American public spheres at the turn of the 19th century. He has previously served as an editorial board member and blog writer for Black Perspectives, the scholarly blog for the African American Intellectual History Society. He currently serves on the Educational Committee for Full North Illuminated, a nonprofit organization dedicated to public programming around Boston's Old North Church and Boston's broader history. He also serves on the editorial board of Early American Studies and Interdisciplinary Journal. He was awarded a Social Transformation Research Collaborative 12 month faculty research fellowship for 2022 2023, and this has helped him near completion of a book manuscript entitled Black Boston and the Making of African American Freemasonry Leadership, Religion, and Community in Early America. Please welcome Dr. Susan. Thank you for that, Dr. Coley, and thank you for all the members of the SDRC uh, who, uh, whose really hard and dedicated work um, uh, helped uh, actually led uh, to make all of this possible. And thank all of you for being here uh, this morning, taking time out of your very busy schedules. So the, the title of this conference is Rights to Story, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in an Age of Banned Books. And in the spirit of this conference, I titled my brief contribution, The Rights to Story, Abolition and Race in an Age of Revolutions. And so I hope to talk about my work by also talking about its historical context and then linking that to uh, the current uh, rise of, of book banning. So uh, the age of revolutions, I use this phrase to refer to the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. These are all violent events with complicated histories where ideas about rights, equality, colonialism, and slavery all impacted each other and intersected um, in very dramatic fashion. 
These wars provide the broad context for my work about African American Freemasonry, and their complicated legacies also link the past with our current moment. So an historic irony emerged from these events, this age of revolutions. On the one hand, people from various segments of English and French society proclaimed that they had rights, and they demanded that those rights be recognized. However, many of these same people argued that there were distinct, innate, and immutable differences between people of African descent and people of European descent. The irony here is that racial ideology took on new and pervasive meaning at precisely the very moment that European nations and their colonies began to develop and promote ideas supporting human equality and popular democracy. And so this seeming paradox frames the writing of Phyllis Wheatley Peters. And so before I talk about her, just briefly on the screen, you have a, a quote from a petition of African Americans from Boston. And they wrote this to the state legislature. And at this point, this was written in 1777. So uh, prior to that, if you think about the Declaration of Independence having been written in 1776, you have these tensions at this moment in the government of Massachusetts between people who support the English parliament and people who support American patriots. And so one of the political maneuvers that abolitionists had to make was, was, was who are they going to try to get on their side? These people who are in support of the English or these people who are in support of this burgeoning movement where both sides in different ways are supporting this language of rights that you see here. So they write this petition to the Massachusetts uh, government, and this highlights the irony that I just briefly described. The American colonies are declaring that their rights are being abrogated, abrogated by the English parliament, and yet they're keeping enslaved people in their midst. So these petitioners are saying, hey, Y'all say you're the enslaved, enslaved by the English, and we're actually enslaved. What's going on here? Um, and so this highlights the, the, the irony. And so um, uh, you could go ahead and uh, move the, the yeah, Thank you. Thank you. And so the same paradox frames the writing of uh, Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, at, many of you know her by Phyllis Wheatley. But recently, scholars, um, in you know, paying close attention to how she named herself, emphasize the fact that she uses the name of her husband, Peter. So, Phyllis Wheatley Peters. She was simultaneously celebrated and demeaned in her own time, and she was, con and she's continued to be a source of consternation for some, while inspiring many others. And so, during the American Revolution, Wheatley embodied the fallacy, the fallacy of racial differentiation and expressed the desire for freedom. Black and white abolitionists held up Wheatley as the best anti-slavery argument. And at the same time, Thomas Jefferson, described as a founder of American democracy um, in you know, a genre of founders writing that probably will never end and will probably pick up as we approach the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this founder uh, argues that Wheatley's poetry was at best derivative and that black people were intellectually inferior to white people. Jefferson expressed the irony of race born from the American Revolution. And if you could move the, the thing, thank you. Oh, sorry, go back, sorry. <laughs> uh, keep it there, thank you, sorry. And so uh, I thought I, had, I included a quote, but I, I didn't, the, the Jefferson's quote from his notes on the state of Virginia, where he talks about Wheatley's work. In a strict sense, Jefferson never argued that Wheatley's book of poetry should not be printed, distributed, or read. However, in a broader sense, Jefferson's dismissal of the black mind constituted a profound attack on the imagination, ideas, and expressions of black people. Although this is 
this might be an obvious point, it demands constant exclamation that the racist roots of book banning are longstanding and pervasive in American history. In response to the paradox of equality and racism, Wheatley, like other enslaved people, appealed to principle. She employed Christian ideas and metaphors to imply that interracial spiritual equality entailed racial equality. If Africans could be Christian, they should be emancipated. And as free people, they should stand as political equals to their white peers. Thomas Jefferson understood that Wheatley's prominence and her understanding reflected the most powerful critiques of slavery and freedom without rights. However, Wheatley embodied freedom and equality. Oh, sorry. However, although Wheatley embodied freedom and equality, we should be careful that we do not read her writing only through the lens of emancipation and politics. Yes, Wheatley was an abolitionist, and she was also curious, but she was also a curious and insightful observer of the human condition. She wrote to express curiosity, love, joy, and she did this for the sake of personal satisfaction. She discussed slavery and equality, but she also wrote about pleasure for its own sake and for the way it could create effective and affirming communities. And this, in some ways, echoes, I think, some of what Susanna was saying about the power of novels, um, especially to affect uh, uh, young folks um, as they are in this period of uh, profound development. So Jefferson's critique and the current book banning movement are perhaps most pernicious in that they try to deny the diversity and vibrancy that are fundamentally necessary for affirming, affirming and generative social relationships. Wheatley rose to prominence at the same time that a group of black men decided that they would enter into a fraternal order. So this is the turn that looks things explicitly about kind of my own work. Like Wheatley, these men were abolitionists. Also like Wheatley, this group held a deep concern for the power of ideas to shape perception. And again, like Wheatley, they published their ideas. Wheatley's poetry and correspondence revealed her to have an astute, to be an astute student of history and to be concerned with the issue of historical interpretation. And this issue of historical interpretation also mattered to the Freemasons. And I think this issue of historical interpretation also matters in this era of book banning, because if you control people's histories, you can control all kinds of narratives about how individuals and communities think about themselves or about how they don't think about themselves. And so Freemasonry emerged um, around the same time that Wheatley rose to prominence. She dies in the early 1780s. Black Freemasonry continues on as a living uh, tradition. And Black Freemasons are interested in history for a variety of reasons. Um, a little bit about Freemasonry. Think uh, men, fraternal order, interested in how the world works. They come together. They're looking around. They're maybe reading some books. They find books uh, written by actual people who build things. And they think, wow, building, that's a useful metaphor for how we should organize our societies and how we should interact uh, with each other. So we're going to um, use these stories from these actual builders um, and take the symbols and metaphors out of those stories and use them to form our own private group. Uh, so that's kind of Freemasonry in a nutshell. And so these stories that were generated by actual builders link these builders to biblical histories. Um, if you're thinking about the Hebrew Bible, the story of uh, Solomon's temple, and how you have all these people coming together to build this thing, and then there's other stories about building various kinds of important religious uh, and sacred sites. And so, so Freemasons, actual Freemasons, stonemasons, um, adopted those stories, and then speculative Freemasons, the people who adopt these stories, see uh, these histories as really important ways of creating these origin stories uh, about their own development, ways of legitimating themselves to a broader public. And one of the things that African-American Freemasons notice when they're reading these myths, these origin stories, 
is that white Freemasons talked about Africa in a particular way and or didn't talk about it in terms of uh, histories that were uh, productive or progressive. So uh, Prince Hall, the founder of the first uh, African-American Lodge, um, writes these narratives that attempt to say Africa matters, people of color matter, and they matter in these sacred histories, these origin stories. And so Prince Hall publishes, uh, begins to publish these in the 1790s, just after, in fact, we have uh, the death of uh, Phyllis Wheatley. So Black Freemasons do this historical writing, that they do this African-American historiography, um, um, if you'll allow uh, the term. They are inventing a past, but they are also responding to previous narratives about the past that leave Black people out. And so the public charges of Black Freemasons were not banned. However, they were responding to their absence, the absence of black voices and actions in prevalent histories. And so these charges were written by the first generation of Freemasons, and they reflected the historical context of the age of revolutions. Thank you. The second generation of Freemasons also wrote and published. And one of those Freemasons uh, was a fellow by the name of David Walker, who's uh, born in the South, but he's born free to a mother who was free, even though his father was enslaved. And he eventually arrives to Boston in the 1820s. He joins this Masonic Lodge, and he writes this pamphlet that's published in 1829, uh, Walker's Appeal in Four Articles. And uh, he writes, uh, this is not that long, um, it's a polemic, uh, it's in many ways incendiary, uh, but it's completely legitimate from the perspective of a history of abolition. And uh, Walker argues many different things. Uh, and one of the things that he argues, using this language of kind of millennialism, this religious language about the end times, is to say that if Southern enslavers don't free their enslaved population, well, then, you know, maybe that enslaved population has every right to rise up and violently overturn um, uh, a society premised upon slavery. Um, do you think people in the South like to hear this story? No, they did not. Um, and in fact, this pamphlet was formally banned uh, in various places throughout the South, even while in many, many places in the North, it was, it was actually uh, uh, popularized. Um, it's also interesting to note that David Walker, um, because of his connections to a free black community in Boston, was very uh, inventive and ingenious in being able to distribute this pamphlet through networks of African-American uh, sailors uh, who would um, uh, arrive to uh, places like Charleston, um, or Richmond and secretly disseminate uh, this pamphlet vis-a-vis -vis, uh, secret networks amongst uh, the enslaved. So this book spoke directly to issues of power, directly to issues of uh, enslavement and of abolition, and even, even to issues of Black expression and Black pleasure. Uh, and it was explicitly, uh, explicitly banned. Um, while at the same time, in some, in some quarters, celebrating. And so, uh, book banning seeks to erase the histories of people either at the margins of society and or those seeking to challenge and even overturn prevailing systems of power that stereotype, dehumanize, and ultimately limit the diversity of human expression. And so in conclusion, I hope that my work uh, illustrates how Black people have fought against the pervasive forces that support current book bans, and that my work also gives historical voice to those past people whose voices have been overlooked, dismissed, or censured. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Torres and
Vincent DePaul Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at DePaul, which is also affiliate faculty in critical ethnic studies and women's and gender studies. She is the editor of the journal Latino Studies and the co-series editor of the Global Latin, uh, Latin Latino uh, American, Ser me, American Series of the University of Ohio Press. Her research and teaching interests include sociolinguistics, Spanish in the U.S. and queer Latinidades. She is the author of Puerto Rican Discourse, a sociolinguistic study of New York Suburb, and co-editor of Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism, and Dorquilleras, Hispanic and the Latina Lesbian Expression. Her co-authored book, Spanish in Chicago, was published last week. Congratulations to you on that, and uh, please welcome Dr. Lopez Thank you, everyone, and uh, specifically, or uh, thank you to, to Julie and to Billy for um, visioning this uh, particular uh, project, and Margaret for helping shape it, and all of you for being here and participating in this. The project is great, um, just to see the, my colleagues and for myself to have this opportunity to have time to do our research, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see the students, the graduate students and the undergraduates who have been funded by this project. So it's just really uh, gratifying on so many different levels to, to be a part of this. So thank you to all of you. And so uh, what I thought I'd do with my time, actually yeah, I was grateful for um, Dr. Ferguson's talk and uh, for reminding us that um, trying to ban books, as he said, it is more than just banning the objects. It, it's really about banning the people hailed by the objects or the books. And so in that spirit, I'm going to talk about my project, which tries to ensure that uh, queer Latino history is part of the, the historiography um, of uh, queer movement and of Latinx movements. Um, I, this project began, uh, I've written some about Latina lesbian organizing in Chicago, kind of for the same reason as um, someone who participated in, in queer Latino movements. Um, as I was reading the historiography, I noticed that the stories of uh, queer Latinos from the Midwest were missing. And so uh, some of my earlier work um, contributed to that effort. And um, as, uh, as I was doing that work, I, I learned about an, an organization called Nebo. If, if we can have the first slide. Uh, that's the second one. Can you go back? Yeah, okay. So um, at a, a conference where I, um, I was presenting on the history of, of Amigas Latinas, I met uh, Leti Gomez, who is um, uh, the person on the left behind these guys in front. And Betty Gomez was, uh, is an incredible activist, uh, long-term activist, 30 years. She was one of the founders of Enlace, which was an organization, a queer uh, Latino organization in Washington. She was also one of the founders of this national organization, Diego. And Diego is uh, um, the only, the first and only queer Latinx organization that has existed in the U.S. It ran for about 20 years, two decades, uh, starting in 1987. Uh, 1987 was the, um, the uh, LGBTQ March on Washington, the first uh, LGBTQ March on Washington. And uh, queer Latinos from around the country took, uh, at the um, behest of Leti Gomez, decided to meet in Washington after the march and try to think about creating a national queer organization. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today, because the funding that I got was to go to the archives and um, learn about this organization, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I found in the archive. 
uh, about this organization, to tell the history of this organization. So Lepi and I uh, decided that we needed to write this history because it doesn't exist. It's history of, of Diego. And so we started, we've, we've been meeting for about five years. We've interviewed about 20 uh, leaders, uh, staff members of the organization. And with the funding that we got uh, last year, Letty and I spent a week at the archives that are at the Benson Library in, um, in Austin, Texas, and digging up the um, information and documents from this history. Um, so um, Letty was one of the organizers, the original organizers, and so um, uh, she tells her version of this history. As we're doing interviews, we find what uh, people who do oral history always find is that there's, when you interview 20 people, there's 20 different histories of, <laughs> of the organization and its origin, and so that's been interesting to, um, to uncover. We also found a lot of really neat documents and photos. Um, what's on the screen? is um, uh, our folks from the original uh, team that worked on um, uh, founding the organization. Um, it started in 1987, and uh, folks decided they needed to become a nonprofit to access funding. So in 1980, uh, 1989, the, the organization became a nonprofit. What, what's on the screen, in addition to the photo, is um, we found the articles of incorporation from the organization, which spell out what the, the purpose of the organization was, and it had um, uh, four uh, um, reasons to, to exist. One was to address the uh, um, issues and concerns of, of Latinx, uh, lesbian, and gay Latinos. Another was to provide a forum for awareness and understanding of Latinx Latino issues. The third was um, really important. This was the 1980s, if you recall, um, um, AIDS, HIV was ravishing the country. Um, very little attention was being addressed to uh, Black and Latinx people with HIV and AIDS. And so um, an important purpose of the organization was to come up with a plan to address the needs of Latinx folks with AIDS, HIV, and other health issues. Um, another goal was to create a network of uh, uh, queer organizations, uh, Latinx queer organizations across the country, and then to educate and advocate for Latino queers. And so the organization started as a small group. Um, it grew constantly. It had it began with two or three affiliates. It ended up in uh, 20 years later with hundreds of affiliates across the country. It was a really good effort at bringing people together. If I could have the next slide, please. These are some of the documents we found there. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, um, you know, why I put this together this way. One of the things the organization did was run yearly conferences or encuentros. And the encuentros were uh, all over the, that they were situated in different cities each time, including um, in Puerto Rico. And um, uh, there was one conference that was in Texas and then in Mexico to show the, the connection. The organization um, was, it, at these conferences, there were always forums for folks to express what they thought the organization needed to be um, focused on, what they weren't doing. And so I thought the organization was really, I think the organization was really good at trying to address the multiplicities of identities that are um, encompassed by Latinx identity, Latinx queer identity. Uh, so um, here you see uh, a few documents. Um, there's the community needs report from Diego's Latina Latino Transgender Summit. 
Our early on in 1990, at the 1997 conference, transgender folks came together and uh, didn't, didn't feel like Diego was addressing their needs. So Diego funded a summit of transgender Latinx folks and um, they uh, advocated for more power within the organization and more attention to their needs. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. Even in the um, beginning of the 1990s, board members were transgender, people working um, on the staff were transgender, um, and the position of the organization was very clearly focused on advocating for transgender Latino folks also, which was pretty early when you think about it. Lesbians at, um, at some of these earlier conferences also felt, especially with the focus on HIV and AIDS, that um, women weren't being uh, addressed, uh, women with AIDS weren't being addressed, with women with HIV, lesbians with HIV weren't be, being addressed, and Latina lesbian um, issues in general were not being addressed. So now the summit took place, and uh, again, the same process of incorporating those concerns and needs in, in the organization. Um, at a later conference, the youth expressed the need that they didn't have any representation in the organization. So again, the same process occurred. So uh, one of the things we'll talk about in the book is how well the organization uh, strive, um, really worked at bringing in all these different voices within the Latinx community. The, um, uh, the, the organization issued a number of reports and had a newsletter. The newsletter addressed um, uh, the efforts um, at uh, addressing the issues that the organization was undertaken. I have an example here of Aquí Llegó, which was the, new, the, the newsletter, and this one came out in the year 2000, and, and the front page um, had a summary on three of the programs that uh, Diego ran, and um, I thought these were interesting programs. The, the middle one, SIPS then, was an, uh, uh, a program that um, the, uh, the, uh, the abbreviation is from a, a, a Spanish term, but in English it would be the International Cooperative on HIV AIDS Prevention in Northern Central America. And so this was a, um, a project that brought together activists from organizations from Central America with Latino folks from the United States to talk about the needs across borders. So the organization had a transnational um, um, focus and effort. Um, the, the bottom program, Horizones, uh, with a program that sought to um, promote uh, Latino male gay leadership within organizations. And La Familia 200, another program sought to advocate for Latinos by um, creating a more expansive understanding of what familia means, including queer folks, for example. And so these were just three of the programs um, that uh, Diego funded and um, led over um, a, a number of the years they um, existed. Um, if we could go to the, to the last slide, please. And so then the, the part of telling the story is telling what happened at the end, why this organization ceased to exist. It, um, it, it went from being a, a, a very small grassroots organization to one that received uh, millions of dollars of funding at the end, in um, 2004, when the organization closed, it had over 30 employees in Washington at the office. It had um, uh, millions of dollars of funding, but all of a sudden, the doors closed. And so part of, of our effort to tell the story of what happened. And just to let you know what happened. <laughs> 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 is that 
that um, from what we have pieced together so far, the most of the funding that was coming to the organization was coming from the CDC. Mm -hmm. It was funding around uh, doing work to prevent HIV and AIDS. But the, uh, the vision of the, uh, of the leaders of the organization was much larger than that. It was to advocate for queer, queer Latinx folks on all fronts, as you can see from some of the projects that the organization undertook. And so unfortunately, most of the funding that the organization could get was from the CDC and was for, from other foundations around doing health work. But the, 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 the organization was doing, as happens with a lot of organizations, right? They had a, a larger vision. The vision was about advocacy. They were going to uh, protest and creating um, um, uh, or becoming part of movements around gay marriages. They were addressing the, um, in the 1990s the issues around the fact that gay people couldn't have, couldn't get, um, didn't have the right to adopt children. They were advocating on domestic violence. All these issues that weren't directly related to the funding that they were receiving, and so they got in trouble. Um, there was a deficit, and um, unfortunately, the um, it, it, the the, uh, the organization had to close. And so we tell that story. Um, we interview. Uh, we've been interviewing a lot of the leaders. Uh, one of the things we we always ask everyone is uh, to tell us what they think the legacy of the organization is. And um, we also ask folks if they think we still need an organization specifically the, uh, uh, devoted to Latinx issues, Latinx queer issues. And there's a range of opinions. A lot of people think the legacy of the organization is that it's successful in bringing together uh, folks from across the nation and um, Latin America to talk about issues of, uh, of importance to the Latinx queer community that it was able to create coalitions with African-American organizations, with Asian queer organizations, in a way that people haven't seen before, that it addressed transgender issues early on. Um, so these were some of the, the things that people felt were really important. And then it's been interesting to, to ask about whether people think such an organization is still necessary. Some people say no, that uh, Queer Latinx folks are integrated enough in um, national LGBTQ orgs, or that national Latino orgs are being uh, more responsible than they have been in the past in addressing queer issues, whereas other people feel that uh, queer Latinx issues are still being ignored by both Latin, Latinx organizations and national um, queer orgs. So there's a diversity of opinions about that, and so um, that what we're doing is is bringing those stories together and, uh, and and telling this history in an effort to make sure um, that our histories are not erased and um, that um, we become part of that historiography that and then push to make sure that our stories are read and shared. Um, in schools and in other forums. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for really your contributions to the project of truly inclusive, collective, and corrective knowledge, and also for reminding us that. What's brought about by these bands is not only something that can be localized to the contours of the U.S. nation state or even the 21st century or even McCarthyism, right? But that it goes that these these have been with us and we've been struggling against these kinds of uh, political process for a very long time. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have well, we don't have any time, but we're going to take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> any any uh, questions or comments? <laughs> thank you all for your excuse me. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I just had a quick question since many of you have worked in archives. 
Um, I was struck by the sense that sometimes archives don't have traces of what you want to find there. Right? Archives are often controlled by institutions that themselves sometimes are policing the kind of information that's recorded. So I guess I would just like um, if you could say a little bit about how you found the traces of the folks that you want to talk about in your archive, um, and also how you deal with the sort of problem that archives may not collect everything, and that you also have to be imaginatively rewriting, right, in some instances, things that um, have been lost that you want to try to capture, or just dealing with that sort of the question of what archives do and don't contain. Um, well, one thing is spending a lot of time there <laughs> and not um, being uh, exclusively guided by the uh, categories and the, the way things are organized, but just spending a lot of time looking through all of the documents in a certain box or whatever gave us a lot of leads that we wouldn't have had if we just paid attention to how people decide to categorize stuff. Another thing that has been useful is talking to these, these funny people that we've interviewed. All of them have their own archives and have been very generous in sharing their documents and uh, in addition to their stories, their documents and their pictures. So our personal archives are always growing and, um, and we're learning new things from, from those uh, particular versions of this history. But it's always incomplete, and um, I, I don't think, I, you know, that's what, um, the more we talk to people and hear diametrically opposed uh, versions of things from people who are in the same room at the same time, we realize that uh, memory is, uh, you know, that what our ideology today is shaping our memories of what happened in the past, and that's also one of the things we have to consider as we're putting together this history. So, uh, the archives of uh, people of color uh, before 1800, uh, the archives of people who are enslaved can seemingly be non-existent. But uh, I think certainly, and thank you for the wonderful question, so the, the way in which one conceives of an archive can be something that is physical. So you go someplace and there are material things that you interact with. And so there's this materiality uh, to the archive that lends to this belief in, in empiricism that, that in order to make an argument, we have to have um, actual documents that support our our argument, and certainly, uh, I I that shapes my work. So, in the context of Prince Hall, people wrote about him. Um, I wanted to know more about his biography. I wasn't able to find more than what had been written. But one of the things I did was to spend a year in an archive and go through 20 years of tax records. And, and if some of you are saying, why would anybody um, <laughs> do that? Um, you, yes, the, the, that on the one hand, that is the proper response. And on the other hand, <laughs> if, if one doesn't do that kind of work, then, then you leave open this question of whether or not we can find anything more else about Prince Hall. So in doing that, so what you find are people in black people who, without going down this rabbit hole of the technicality of the thing, black people are listed in tax records. You just have names, but, but if you have names of people who write this petition to go to Africa in 1787, and you have names of people who wrote the petition that I just put up on the board, and you have names of people who are in tax records, and you have names of members of the um, African Masonic Lodge, it's this painstaking work of creating these networks that do actually begin to give you really useful empirical information um, about these people. Now, having said that, there's also this issue of how one theorizes the archives. And so here I'll use Phyllis Wheatley as an example. So if we use her writings as an archive, a 
material kind of thing, documents. Uh, there's wonderful work being done about her right now, and I want to highlight the work of um, Tara Bynum, University of Iowa, and she's uh, recently published a book about uh, Phyllis Sweetly. And one of the things that um, Tara um, would say, and this in some ways gets to my comment about community, she said that when she first was reading uh, Phyllis Wheatley's correspondence in writing, um, she wondered who Phyllis Wheatley's friends are. And so Tara would go to these places and Tara would ask the audience, okay, you know, Phyllis Wheatley was an enslaved woman, black enslaved woman. Do you think that she had any friends? And the audience would be completely silent. Mm -hmm. And not, and not surprisingly, right? Because the narrative is that, well, enslaved people didn't have a voice, and not only was she enslaved, even though she was able to be published, she's this black woman living in a white society. So, of course, she did not have friends. Um, but when you, and this is where theory is really useful in rethinking what we think of as the archives. When you think about Phyllis Wheatley, not as somebody who's just, let's say, upset about being an enslaved person, but somebody who's curious about the world. Somebody who experiences joy and pleasure alongside her dissatisfaction. Tara Bynum talks about going back and reading Whitley's poems and seeing Whitley use the word love and use, and use the word joy. Um, and this opens Whitley up as a human. Um, and it also opens up how we understand her, her writing. And so, in addition to networks and archives as material things that we should go to, we also have to be cognizant of the presuppositions and assumptions that we bring to reading the things that we find in those places. And if we, in many cases, reshape our approach, our conceptual theoretical perspectives, we can read documents in, in, in new ways and find really new and exciting things. Well, I'll be super brief because I didn't really use archives uh, for this project, but I'll make a plug for uh, <laughs> our uh, Brockman Romero archives that are used in my courses. And uh, you know, anybody out there that wants to do some research on Central America, they are so valuable because um, you'll in the in these Brockman Romero archives, you'll see uh, like. Archbishop Romero's um, homily asking the soldiers to stop committing, to stop killing their brothers uh, and sisters. And you'll see um, the letter that uh, Archbishop Romero wrote to then President Jimmy Carter, who was sending, you know, now we'll, now we'll laugh at the kind of money that the US was sending daily to El Salvador to commit these human rights violations. Now it's insignificant compared to everything we're spending in the wars and nothing on humanitarian aid. Um, so I would highly plug that. And another plug is that uh, this year I've got the Humanities X grant and the project is um, the, the fellowship. And um, the project there is to study a community organizations archives, Seattle and the Christian leadership, uh, Christian religious leadership network here in Chicago has done amazing activism across Central America and Latin America. And uh, so the students are gonna work in the archives and they're gonna be able to conduct interviews with people who are involved in the sanctuary movement, who are really, they're, they're getting up there in age like us. And uh, we start to forget we need to document this history. And it's so amazing for our young student activists to learn from the wisdom of these um, amazing leaders we have here. And plug your own article. You have an article about teaching in the archives. Yes. 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 Yeah, in teaching Central America. It's called Teaching Central America in. It's an MLA <laughs> for it. <laughs> I also want to say, Jim's the archive, it connects back to Samara's question after Dr. Ferguson's talk about songs, mm -hmm. right? And the really wonderful work that's being done now by people, certainly through American studies and, and sound studies on the sonic archives, mm -hmm. right? And how and people, you know, like Marisa Fuentes, Christina Shaw, like just rethinking how we have to understand the archives, particularly of black people in, in this nation. And I think that that's really wonderful work being, being done there in terms of just 
rethinking how we reconstruct stories and in a speculative form that's always part of scholarship in some way um, is really a wonderful and welcome return. Um, I think we have, to, we have to stop. So I want to just um, say thank you to our panelists. Thank you to you all. Yeah. No, you. Oh, I'm introducing. I'm so sorry. This is, this is me. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Valerie Johnson, who is our new associate provost of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes, we're going to leave now. Okay. Would you like to vote? I can do it. Oh no, I'm just. <laughs> We're family. I don't need a podium. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I um, am just so happy to be among people who have the same view of education as I do. Uh, we know that an enduring question is the role of education, right? And uh, it is true, as Paulo Freire says, in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that education can be used as a tool of, uh, to, to just sort of continue the status quo. And it's, uh, of course, focused on maintaining that dispossession of those who are from marginalized groups. Or it can be used as a vehicle for social transformation. Right, and that is, of course, um, the embodiment of the social transformation resource uh, uh, research collaborative. One of my favorite lines in uh, the DePaul's University mission says that uh, through research and education, the university um, responds to the challenging questions of the day, and in the process promotes peace and a, a, you know so injustice and solutions to some of our most challenging problems. Certainly, racism, environmentalism, uh, xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera, homophobia. Those are some of the challenges, challenging questions of the day. We see that as we have expanded rights for the dispossessed, there has been a concerted effort to sort of place all of those, uh, all, all of the groups or people who are members of, a, of a marginalized groups back in the closet, so to speak. Uh, it is the role of education. It is the role of the social transformation research collaborative to give life to those dispossessed communities. And you can see that through the work of the fellows. I mean, when you look at the work of the Summer Institute for New Students, I mean, it is, uh, you're talking about embodying the mission, addressing the social questions of, of the day, and grooming students to become active and engaged members of society and agents for change. You all, Margaret, Billy, Julie, you all are uh, definitely meeting the mission and you are sp responding rightly to the role of education. And so I just wanna thank you all. Greetings from Academic Affairs. Thank you. Thank you.